Thank you, David, for, uh, for introducing the panel. Uh, it's good to be back here at Heritage. I used to represent the conservative wing of the Heritage Foundation during my days, uh, but I'm glad now that you're uh, upholding that important role. Uh, I want to make one basic comment that I think underscores the importance of everything we're going to be talking about. Uh, and you sort of got this, of course, uh, from Alvin, and you'll hear it uh, later on uh, today as well. But tax rates matter. And what, what really frustrates me is that politicians understand this when they want to. A lot of times we see politicians, uh, federal, state, local level, you know, banging their fists saying we need higher taxes on tobacco because we want people to smoke less. Now, I'm at a libertarian think tank. I don't think it's government's job to try to control our private choices. But you know what? I give those politicians an A plus for economics because they're right. The higher the tax you put on something, the less you're going to get of it. I mean, you'll also get cigarette smuggling and other you know, negative side effects. But the fundamental economic point they're making is right. High tax rates discourage what's being taxed. My frustration is that many of those same politicians forget that lesson when it comes to taxes on work, saving, investment, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, the things that help our economy grow, the things that make us more prosperous, the things that create jobs, make us competitive. So that's really what tax reform, in my mind, uh, I try to you know, make it as simple as possible. That's what it's about. We want more growth and prosperity. And, and you heard Alvin just saying over and over again, consumption-based tax. My job on this panel is to try to explain why that's important. It's important because our current tax system treats income that you save and invest much, much worse than the income that you can consume. Think about it in this very simple fashion. You make some money, you pay tax on that money, what's left? Disposable income or after-tax income. You have two choices of what to do with your after-tax income. You can consume it right away or you can consume it in the future. What's consuming in the future? It's saving and investing. Now, let's think about how the federal tax system treats those two choices. If you consume your after-tax income right away, the federal government, by and large, leaves you alone. Yeah, we have a federal excise tax on gasoline. We even have a federal excise tax on bows and arrows. But, but other than a few obscure things like that, there's really no federal tax on consuming your income. But what happens if you save and invest your income instead? In other words, you consume your income in the future. Well, between the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, the double tax on dividends, and the death tax, it's possible for that single dollar of income to be taxed over and over and over again. And you don't have to be a wild-eyed supply sider to think that if you have even low tax rates, but those low tax rates imposed multiple times, that you're going to be doing something that's going to dramatically or at least significantly affect people's decisions on whether to consume their income today or can consume their income in the future. Now, why does it matter economically? So what? Okay, so people want to consume their income faster rather than slower because saving and investing is treated harshly by the tax code. What difference does that make? Well, it makes a big difference because every single economic theory doesn't matter, we could have a socialist up here, we could have a Marxist up here. Every single economic theory is based on the notion that you have to defer some of today's consumption to finance tomorrow's growth. You have to have what's called, what economists call capital formation. And yet, our tax system, as I just explained, mistreats and abuses the people who save and invest. Why? Well, because Rich people tend to have a lot of saving and investing. That's really it. There's no underlying sensible economic theory behind it. It's simply, as Willie Sutton said about why he robbed banks, that's where the money is. Well, that's why politicians double tax and triple tax and sometimes even quadruple tax saving and investing. And let me try to sum this up with an analogy that I think perhaps makes it very, very clear. Imagine if you owned an apple orchard. You're getting into the fall. Your apples are ripe. It's time to harvest them. What's the best way to harvest those apples? Do you pick them from the tree or do you chop down the tree? Apples are income. The trees are capital. 
The reason we want a so-called consumption-based tax is because we don't want to mistreat capital. But to understand why it's so foolish, you don't need to think about, okay, Marxism, socialism, free market theories. Just think about it this way. If you chop down the tree, or to be technically more accurate to what the current tax system does, if you harvest apples by sawing off the branches of the tree, what does that do for your long-run prosperity, for your long-run income? You're obviously going to have fewer apples next year, so it doesn't make sense to double and triple and quadruple tax capital. In other words, on this one issue, the Marxists and the socialists are right because they happen to agree with sensible economists. You need the capital formation for long-run growth, and that's why we should have a tax system that treats all income equally, and that means no longer double taxing income that is saved and invested. You want neutrality, not only neutrality in the sense of getting rid of all the loopholes, but also neutrality in how you earn and how you spend your income. Thank you very much.